blackout conditions. Any unit at the River Hospital, we've got four people trapped in the basement. Sounds like it's surrounded by fire and they're safe. We I know you don't bring people to the out. The hospital if we can. And we've got the fire uh, coming. Mother Nature, she's not very happy with us right now. The fire continues to grow, classified a mega fire, growing more than 100,000 acres. State of emergency in where the deadliest and most destructive wildfire in the state's history. Thousands of firefighters are hitting the front lines, working 24 hour shifts to battle the flame. We used to have fire seasons, now we have fire years. And I think it's our firefighters that are paying a big price for that. National Park, a second firefighter was killed while battling the Ferguson fire. The Ver As you're risking life and limb out there, the least we could do is take care of them when they're taking care of the country the way they do. Most people in America don't even realize what wildland firefighters are. How dangerous it is. How many of them don't come home. Range 10 West, Meridian, uh, latitude 41. 37.475 by... What doesn't the public know about wildland firefighters? You know, when most people hear firefighter, they go right to the red truck that's driving around downtown. That's a uh, structure firefighter. It's a huge difference. Structure guys defend structures. Wildland firefighters defend nature. Fire officials say they've been using hot shots who are famous for being the best of the best. Hot shots there, first one's in on a wildland fire. Stuff that you and I would want to hike, absolutely not, and they do it carrying a 40-pound pack of tools, working their way up it. You go to fires and people have a high expectation of us. You're expected to do the longest shifts, do the hardest things, go to places where no one else goes. Gone from families seven months at a time, pretty much. We're on fires 14, 16 days with travel, home to, gone again. 14, 16 days, home to, gone again. Back to back to back. They're right on the line of the fire with hand tools, digging a line to stop that fire from moving to more vegetation. Yeah, there's a lot into fire that I don't think people are very aware of at all. Do they know that they run through the forest with no respirators on, with just a bandana over their face? Do they know that they travel around in 10-man buggies for millions of miles a year? Do they know that they're repelling out of helicopters and jumping out of planes on top of trees that are burning? I think as far as dangerous jobs out there, um, you know, it, it's as dangerous as it gets. My name is Burke Miner. I'm the director of the Wildland Firefighter Foundation. You'll hear me say in any kind of presentation I ever do, the Wildland Firefighter is the most underrated public servant we have. You know, we like to honor and recognize them all through the year, so certainly appreciate all you coming together to support this cause, so thank you. Thank you. My mom, Vicki Miner, had a vision back in 1994. I used to do contract commissary for the Forest Service. 1994, 14 people burned to death on Storm King Mountain. They'd all died in an instant, one of the worst firefighting disasters in recent history. I would be in camps and at night you could hear some of those firefighters weep in their tents. And so we created a memorial shirt one of our goals was to uh, sell that t-shirt out of our commissary for the rest of that fire season. 
to send that money to the families of Storm King. That year, we raised $108,000 selling those t-shirts inside the compounds. We sent that money back east to a nonprofit. Uh, we checked on the money a year later to see the progress of, you know, how it touched the lives and, and what it had done, and uh, figured out the money had never even got to the families. I'd ask them what happened to that money, and they said it was uh, administration costs, and, and uh, that really bothered me. And so we started this foundation in my kitchen. Wildland Firefighter Foundation is a nationally known nonprofit. Our main mission is to reach in and sustain the home of a fallen or injured wildland firefighter. When that firefighter goes down, the rent doesn't stop, groceries don't stop, none of that stops, except for the paycheck and, and the family member uh, that's not coming home. And that's where we step in immediately, and we start getting that household whatever it needs. We found out that he had a wedding ring in the jewelry store and we went down and got it out and so she could have it before he was buried. And that's why we don't take government money, is we wouldn't have the fluidity to move and do the things that are from here. We're just a drop in the bucket uh, compared to the amount of people that we serve. Here we go. Nationally, 54 new fires. Seven days significant fire potential, as you can see, hot and dry until the weekend. And then there is a red flag warning for southwest Wyoming for strong, gusty winds. As you guys know, we had that fire out on the Salmon Chalice yesterday. It sounded like that was 75 acres. I'm never going to forget my first actual jump. was slightly terrifying. The reason smoke jumpers are around is uh, they jump on fires that the fire truck can't get to. When the fire call comes through, I literally have no idea where I could end up. When you leave, you don't know how long you're gonna be on that fire. And so we need all the equipment that we might need for a long duration. Typically, that's going to be 110 plus pounds. Because there's no door on the aircraft, we put our hand over the red handle of our reserve parachute so it doesn't accidentally deploy. That kind of sucked the smoke jumper outside of the aircraft. Smoke jumpers are up against hazards and dangers, you know, from the moment that buzzer flies. Getting on the plane, jumping out of the plane. And then when they get to the ground, you know, they're in fire. Around the fire. There's just one danger after the other. But it's, it's there and it's real. There's snakes, yellow jackets, poison oak. We lost a firefighter last year. Uh, a tree fell on him. We have a uh, down firefighter. We need you to provide medical care for it. When that uh, call came, um, I mean, no one ever trained me to uh, talk to a mother that had lost her son or daughter. Um, and there's, there's no way to teach that or prepare that. There was always so much music in our house. Luke was a guitar playing fool. Ready to go, Soph?
My son, Luke Sheehy. Luke was a smoke jumper. That was a big part of who he was. Luke was the kind of guy who, he just always made me feel like I, I had somebody that would, no matter what, would drop everything to be there for me. We ended up hiring Luke. He was one of the best firemen I've ever had work for me. He was always top notch, did anything, anytime, anywhere for anybody. And anything for a fun moment. <laughs> June 10th, 2013. Got a knock on the door. A burning branch had fallen, landed on Luke and killed him. Doug was a very broken father when I met him. Uh, that was a very busy season. Uh, I believe we had 42 line of duty fatalities that year. When someone you love dearly dies, your world just cracks open. Describe what the wildland community is because there's so many intricate parts to it. You no, know, wildland firefighting is not just the guy hiking up the hill. There's a lot of moving pieces and people that make that happen. A wildland firefighter incident, these camps can go 90 days at a time. A fire starts, and if they can't catch it within that first 24-hour period, then instantly we're called in. Hey, Dust, how are you? Usually late at night, 10 to 1 o'clock in the morning, and they need us immediately. When the wildland fires happen, they usually go in places out in the middle of nowhere. For five months a year, Julia's on the road. She works a lot of cars going from fire to fire to fire. Come on back, Jeff, looking good. We're setting up a whole little city out in the middle of no man's land within hours always. If we're late, they're not going out to the field in order to fight the fire. Morning, everyone. Morning. Morning. The big thing today is that we had a push to the south here, about 5,000 acres, homes threatened. Got to get this north end buttoned up today and tomorrow to withstand those kind of winds. There are so many people involved in all of this. And sometimes we have a community of 40,000 people out there on different fires all over the nation. You're always got to be ready. When they say we need you, they need you. It's required to have a laundry service because when they're up there in that poison oak and it's burning, they need to be able to wash those clothes. You know you're away from your friends, your family, but what I love about it is when they get their clean clothes, it makes their day more comfortable. They're the ones putting their neck out for us to preserve this beautiful country we live in. And if I can make it a little bit better, that's what I would, you know, like to do. Everybody knows the importance of what they're doing. The fuel's got to be there. There's no equipment running without it, no chainsaws, nothing. So they basically are not going to fight the fire without fuel. We try to do, you know, a nice fresh barbecue, fresh homemade meatloaf. Look at it out there. I mean, these guys are out, out there. 
come on back here, get some good food, get some coffee, sit back, readjust, and think about the, the next step. You know, no, we're not, we're not firefighters, but there's a lot of pride that you take knowing that you're helping the effort. We feel like we come in and actually help. We help to save the forest, we help to save lives, and hopefully we help to save firefighters. Julie's on the go all the time. She's been a contractor most of her life and a huge supporter of this foundation. My family is a firefighting family. I'm third generation, my kids are fourth generation. I had a niece, she was a hotshot, and she was ran over in the field. She was as close to death as one gets. The Wildland Firefighter Foundation instantly jumped in there and they just made sure all of our logistical needs were taken care of. At that point, I realized how important they were and there's so many people in the field that need them. When an uh, injury or a fatality happens on a big event there, everybody's ears are out there. They know what's going on. Uh, they hear the radio traffic. The wildland community, it doesn't matter if you're a state, a federal, smoke jumper, hotshot, they've all been touched with losing someone they knew. At least there's this healing place in Boise, Idaho, where people can go. Here's guys that were remembered from 1935. I went to the Vietnam Wall with a combat vet in Washington, D.C., and I saw the healing that happened to those men when they would touch the name on the wall. This is in the shape of a Pulaski. This is a tool that the firefighters use. And, then... and I came back and I thought, we don't have any place like that for wildland firefighters. I shared that idea with some people and it just grew and grew. This is Granite Mountain, 19 burned to death. And this is Storm King, 14 burned to death. If it wasn't for this place and the foundation across the street where their pictures hang, there would be no place here in America to remember all these wildland firefighters. Probably the toughest thing I ever had to do was face a mother that lost a son or a daughter. And they do that year in, year out, and uh, just love on these people. I have no idea how they can do it. Dealing with injured and fallen firefighters is a year-round thing now. I think people are blown away when they come in here to see how small our staff really is to the amount of people that we serve. Obviously, being a nonprofit, we're up against funding all the time. We try not to worry about where the money's come, but it takes time to find donors to specific to your mission. Um, it takes time to write grants. It takes time to do all that. And sometimes we don't have time here in the fire season. Fire don't give you time, you know? A thousand people are unaccounted for. Think about that. Over a thousand people unaccounted for in Northern California after a fast-moving wildfire demolished the small town of Paradise. The firefighter killed today died. The second firefighter was killed while battling so the So at Ferguson. this point, they're expecting this death toll to rise. It's already the deadliest in California history. These guys were saying this fire was moving so fast, they couldn't stay in front of it. That house was lucky to be there. Big, nice house. He came up here a lot to run and mountain bike and stuff like that. After Luke died, 
we were in some alternative universe. Didn't know what we were doing with ourselves. I had no idea what the Wildland Firefighter Foundation was. And now I can say, oh, thank goodness for Burke. You know, I guess it all started with a uh, fundraiser. One of our hotshot crews approached their, their local distributor company just to get some beer donated uh, for their event they were having. But we got a call the next day from Coors Banquet. How can we help you more? When we got this building, this was all hollow in here and it echoed when you walked in here. And then after we got the shirts up, you could smell the smoke in here from the shirts. Every shirt you see in here has been brought here uh, by an engine, by a crew, been pulled out of a, a dirty 14-day bag. We had a shirt come in the mail today. Uh, we appreciate the tour, everything you do with the foundation. Here's an addition to the wall of shirts. Uh, and this guy's out of uh, Chugiak National Forest in Moose Pass, Alaska. The shirts just keep coming in. I mean, we can't go a couple days without shirts uh, coming in. Without the funding of, of Banquet, uh, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing on the scale we're doing. You know, going to its fifth year now, uh, reaching more firefighters in a season uh, with their yearly donation. Judy decided to show hey, up. Hey, hey, hey. What's up, man? This is always the first stop right here. Luke died on a Monday, and two days later, Burke Miner of Wildland Firefighter Foundation arrived at the smoke jumping base. They never say, hey, what do you need? They would just show up with coffee in the morning or grab a load of laundry. That's exactly WFF. This foundation is important to us because we know we're changing people's lives. Because of Coors Banquet, we've been able to subsidize those firefighters who sacrifice so much to protect our West. And they brought some spark back to some of those families. This I got at the foundation. It says, I may look harmless, but I raised a wildland firefighter. One of the hardest things about losing my son, you have all his clothes. And so I, we had boxes of t-shirts and you, you know, it's hard to just take him to goodwill. I mentioned it to Vicki and that's all you have to do with Vicki is mention something. Lynn, Luke's mother, had all these shirts, and I said, you send us those shirts, we'll make a blanket. This is such a wonderful thing from WFF. And of course, this has been our mantra. A friend of Luke's came up with this shortly after he died. Live like Luke. Here's Luke Sheehy's marker. I was talking to Doug one time and he told me he was playing his guitar. And he could feel Luke right here behind him. One gift that I, I've gotten from Luke is that, you know, sorrow is just as valuable as joy. Whatever, whatever, Feel it as deep as you can. Uh, live in the moment fully. Those stories help me understand that what we think of as the end is just a new beginning somewhere else. Yeah,
I don't know how we could have survived through that period without WFF. Come on, son. Come on, son. Let's go see Lucas. Hey. We are here at the Luke Sheehy Memorial Park. I was amazed at the uh, purpose and commitment he found uh, in wildland firefighting. You know, your time was cut short, but the time that you lived, you ought to be awfully proud. folks in the firefighting business. Uh, years ago, I can say honestly that uh, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for a couple firefighters. You saved my house in the Thomas fire, and you guys have been so amazing in this fire, and can't thank you enough. Thank you again from Westlake Village. Namaste, thank you to all the brave firefighters. I, I am so full of uh, gratitude for all your hard and amazing work. You really, you pulled off a miracle. Thank you so much for taking time away from your family and coming to Reading to save our community. Cheers to you guys. Cheers to you. Cheers to you guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. Cheers to you. Cheers <laughs> <Okay>. to you. <laughs> Y'all are awesome. <laughs>